להגיד את האחר, להגיד את האחר, להגיד את האחר. Well, if some of the techniques employed in the first small countries that yeah, are not feasible in other parts of the world. So if you see the types of French, German, Spain, England, the United States and Japan, they're saying sometimes it's not our reality in the third world countries like uh, Brazil, India, China, whatever. So we have to and we have to understand the difference between the medicine in France and the United States. Like here, you know, there's a guy in school of money here, it's a camp in Brazil, where we are doing surgery almost for food. So it's a big difference between the United States, France, and Brazil. But as people are using them to speak, we don't have it in our hands. So this is not a good reason for not having also a good thing and seeing beauty in poverty. So, to win the, the war against chronic appendix media that is pretty prevalent in our country, we have to use different strategies and adapt our own and other arsenal. So we have a war here. And who is the enemy? The enemy is the Colossiatoma, whose definition is the presence of accumulation of the affiliated therapy within the Middle East for any anesthetic area of the temple bone. This is the classic definition of this map of 1974. Uh, to make it simple, polycythoma is, is seen in the wrong place. That's the best definition of polycythoma that I hold. If you look at this picture, you see the Rio de Janeiro, and here we have what they call the sugar roll. You can just look at the sugar roll, because it's still stolen in the south of the day of the ocean. So it's a misnomer. As for the scatomony, for the scatomony comes from cholesterol that doesn't have, the scatomony that comes from fat tissue that for the also doesn't have, and soma that is a tumor that for the scatomony is not at all. So it's a really bad name, but the few are stuck with this name. Maybe the best name would be teratoma that was proposed by Shumek, but nobody used it. So let's move on. The histology of polycythoma, uh, you can divide the polycythoma in three parts. The cystic content with keratin and epithelial cells. The matrix that is seen, I will classify the with epithelial and with keratin. And also the most important part, in my opinion, the perimatrix, where you're going to have massive tissue, fibers, and inflammatory cells. So this is the histology of polycythoma. We have many classifications in this episode, there is not only one, but we can use many. So you can be congenital or acquired, one of the systems. And the congenital polycythoma you will find in the symptomatical, you see the naked, the cerebral pontine angle, the jugular corona, and the instantaneous. Something acquired that you can didactically divide in primary and secondary. And you will have the external of the polycythoma. Here we have two congenital polycythomas behind an intact embedded membrane. We must fix our attention in congenital polycythoma in the lecture. We we'll move on to the acquired type. And this is the start of the corticanal polycythoma. The dead membrane looks fine. If you remove the optoscope a little bit, you see the accumulation of keratin and erosion of the external of the corticanal. This is not so common, but still we see these patients, and sometimes we're going to have invasion of the neck, and sometimes you can see the wall. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. According to the surgical profile, you can have the cosmetic of cystic polycythoma and what we call the old kind of polycythoma, so they have to come all over the place. From the clinical perspective, there's basically three types of, we used to have three types of polycythoma the posterior synthetic or the parts plastic polycythoma, the posterior metal synthetic or the parts stamina. And the anterior epithelium is very rare for the So we have studied this, this pattern of growing of the solicitoma, and you could see that uh, sometimes when you look to our cases, you see that our sense of the soil would comprise 35% uh, of our concentrate. Our splatter would be 35%, and uh, this very rare anterior epithelium like two percent of the case. But still, if you make our counting, we go up to 89 or 29 percent of the consoles that are needed. So we try to look 
for the Tazoma, then the mock TV in the traditional classification. And you came to the conclusion that you see 30% of the Polytatoma falling in two rooms, neither the Tiranet Symbolic and Bart Plaza Polytatoma, and also in 30% of the cases cannot determine the place of the Polytatoma. Probably they come from collectors uh, in addition to them in open Polytatoma activity. So we have a new classification with the posterior synthetic part of the the posterior medical vanity part of the the very rare anterior synthetic, but also the posterior end of the synthetic for two rows on the cytomas and the under the under the that are not so usual. It is important to make this classification. I think we have deep implications regarding the surgical and planning technique and the pathophysiological understanding of these diseases. The pathogenesis. There are many theories. So we would simplify the pathogenesis with two theories. The marginal TM perforations with the secondary cholecytoma will arise with the lack of the shield of the tympanic membrane and epithelial migration through the perforation. Like in this case here, we have a central perforation, probably the migration of the skin will stop in the uh, fibrotic ring around the perforations. But if you have a marginal perforation like this, you have the chance of the epithelium to grow inside the middle ear and later make, make himself cystic and exfoliated generation, uh, generating a cholesteatoma. Like in those cases here, we have marginal perforations and migration of the skin inside the middle ear. Uh, we don't see these cases very much, so it is a theory, but we have to question it. There's another one that goes through progressive TM retractions, and you have a series of events here coming from invagination, adhesion, lack of self-cleansing properties, keratin exfoliation, and keratin accumulation. So we would go from simple retractions, where the base of the retraction is smaller than the opening, it moves to retraction pockets where the base is much bigger than the opening, accumulation of keratin, infection, and cholesteatoma proliferation. That's the general uh, script of the formation of this pathology. The invagination theory has pros and cons, and we have to understand some of these things. We will not have time to cover this, but as I said, it moves from the simple retraction to the retraction pocket and cholesteatoma. So here we have the retraction, and the retraction would do specifically in two parts, in the posterior superior quadrant and in the pars flaccida. Following the retractions, uh, we have some mechanisms that would predispose the retractions, and what's the possible? Everybody thinks about tubal obstructions, lack of air. But we have also patulous eustachian tube. Manoir study a lot about that. What is, I mean, escape of air from the middle ear. And also the mucosal disease for consumption of air. There are three ways that you're gonna have negative pressure within the middle ear as the first stage, only the first stage of the colosseum. So if you move on, you have the <laughs> obstruction of the eustachian tube, but also the mucosal disease you know, leading to consumption of gas inside the middle ear, and you're gonna have negative pressure depend on the great degree of inflammation within the middle ear cleft. It's common during the secretory otitis media cases. And sometimes it's very perplexing, but it's very common, don't you agree with me, Manuel, that you have even cases with a patulous eustachian tube, generation negative pressure. Like in this case here, you see what the patient is able to do with tympanic membrane, and there is a big retraction. He's breathing, and the tympanic membrane moving. Or this young lady here with a pars flaster cholesteatoma. You can see also, see, she will sniff and move the tympanic membrane. There's a lot of air in this middle ear, but we have a cholesteatoma and a pars flaster. How come? Or here, this is the champion. I like this guy. This is the Rafael, his name. Look at what he does with the tympanic membrane. Just briefing. Of course, one of these days, this tympanic membrane will be stuck in here and create a cholesteatoma of the pars tensa. 
So we think about uh, eustachian tube obstruction. I think we should think more about patches of this tube. I think you're going to talk about that, right, Manuel? So what are the screenplay and the actors of TM retractions? We have the effusion and negative pressure, generation and inflammatory environment. Later on, you're going to have progressive atrophy of the middle layer and then the retractions. You have to remember that tympanic membrane is not a fiber, a muscular fiber. If you move it too much, it's going to get atrophic, you know, and not hypertrophic like the, for example, any other part in the, uh, of the body. So you're going to have things like this, pure atrophy of the tympanic membrane because of the expansion, the overexpansion of the tympanic membrane generated by the patchless eustachian tube. So, if you drop the intertympanic pressure, go it back. For example, you let's go over here. You have a faulty function of the eustachian tube, and drop the intertympanic pressure. This is a step one. This is not enough to generate a cholesteatoma. So we have the disturbed physiology, <coughs> changes in the homeostasis of the middle ear, and then later on you have the pathological development. This is the screenplay. So I said the first stage is just simple retraction, like this guy here. You have a really bad retraction in the ear, but the ear is still dry. dry. You have bony erosion through, through micro pressure, but you don't have hyperproliferation. So what the first, in my opinion, you know, the first thing that this retraction would cause would to bring together the middle ear mucosa and the tympanic membrane epithelium, you know, in the middle you see the perimatrix of the cholesteatoma. That's what the negative pressure, just bring the things together. Doesn't create anything, just bring the things together. If you move on, these retractions will, will be, there is a preference for the retraction in the posterior superior because of anatomical changes here or uh, details here. And also, of course, due to the tympanic Diaphragm, it will gonna happen also in the pars flaccida, you know, the epitympanic area of the middle ear. Like here and here, you have all diaphragms, they are covered. So you're gonna have a tympanic uh, the retraction only in the pars flaccida. Like in this case here, you have a bad retraction, erosion of the head of the malleus and the incus, but the pars tensa here is fine. Why? Because you have a blockage of the tympanic isthmus here. That's my idea. And what happens is like this. You know, you have the retraction, you're going to touch the obstacles, and then the, stash, the, the, the action will start going on. So once you put them all together, you're going to have the second phase. I guess you have the second phase I move. is not only the retraction, but then the inflammation and infection, right? And it may come from outside in, from the external auditory canal, or from inside out, from the middle ear. But anyway, you're going to have an inflammatory environment here. And then the epithelium will respond with mediators, with proteinases, and angiogenesis. And then you start a phase of hyperproliferation. This is the third stage, right? So the cholesteatoma has self-components, the cystic content and the matrix, and shared components with the middle ear mucosa, namely the perimatrix. And the perimatrix for us is uh, very important. It varies with age being thicker in children. We have done studies on that. So the st third stage is then inflammation, infection, in hyperproliferation. You're going to have things like this. So this is the sequence. I, I went it really fast so you can understand, but of course it's more complicated than that. But the perimatrix, in our opinion, is the authentic battlefield between the advancing cholesterol in one side and the natural defense of the medial ear mucosa on the other side. There is where the things happen, the perimatrix. Well, what's the battlefield? The battlefield is the middle ear, and sometimes you, well, it's not so important, you know, it's... Uh, find small surgery. No, no, no. We have a space like this with the, our neighborhoods are the middle fossa, fossa dura up here, posteriorly the posterior fossa and the sigmoid sinus. We have the labyrinth in the middle, the anterior labyrinth is with the stapes, 
We are sitting over the jugular bulb, as we saw this morning. We have the carotid artery right in our left, and in the middle of everything, we have the facial nerve. So it's a very complicated battlefield, and you have to know and get to know, as you said this morning, this area. Even the CT scan will not be a replacement for knowing the anatomy. What are weapons? Well, we have mastoidic techniques. This morning we have seen two. We saw a closed cavity when you open the facial recess that you could do it posteriorly through the tympanotomy, or you can do it anteriorly with the endoscopes. Or you can do the open cavity where you remove the posterior wall, but we do reconstruct the middle ear with uh, ossicoloplasty and tympanoplasty. This is the open cavity tympanomastoidectomy. If you cannot do this, then you do exactly what we call a radical mastoidectomy, where you do not reconstruct anything, you just occupy yourself of blocking the eustachian tube and open up the whole space of the mastoid, the external auditory canal, and the middle ear. <clears throat> what are the strategy to treat this disease? Well, uh, this is the dilemma from Shakespeare, to be or not to be, that's the question. The dilemma from the otologist since 1950 is open or care or close. That's the question. You know, you have been discussing this kind of things for more than 50 years, and we came up to a conclusion. This morning they have done two surgeries different. So uh, if you look through the years, you see that the open technique was very common in the 50s. And later on in the 70s, when they described the closed technique, uh, autologists from all over the world move to the uh, closed technique. But it has changed a little bit in the 80s, 90s, and the years 2000. Now people are more conservative in terms of going from one side to the other. So what are the reasons that the open technique is regaining a little bit of his pop uh, popularity? Two reasons. The first one is the recurrent disease. That means uncontrolled pathogenesis. There is, it's lower uh, rates of recurrent in open cavities. And also residual disease, that's disease left behind. So it's different, recurrent and residual disease. And both are lower in the open cavities, which have another problems, but these ones are lower. So there is this guy, this uh, famous uh, otologist that was uh, very enthusiastic with closed cavities, and now he mentioned that closed cavity tympanomastoidectomy represents the first stage of open tympanomastoidectomy. Sometimes it's true. And you know, size matters. Sometimes, you know, I'm, I do all the cases uh, closed cavity, but uh, sometimes the pathology conspires against you. Like in this case here, uh, try to do a closed cavity or endoscopic surgery in this cholesteatoma, that you need a shovel to remove the cholesteatoma from the middle ear and the mastoid. Look at this. So the cholesteatoma decided for you. You, you have no options. It has decided many years ago, actually, as a matter of fact, and we're still facing problems like this in Brazil, problem in South Africa and other countries, Lebanon maybe. I don't know, maybe Lebanon, they are rich guys, so probably not. And you think it's done? Not quite. We move a little bit more. So the surgery is ready. <laughs> <laughs> I will come to this point. So let's move. Well, coming to your question, I have this patient that was referred to me as a congenital cholesteatoma. The CT show the congenital cholesteatoma is very funny because normally this anterior portion of tympanic membrane, this is posterior. But anyway, let's see the t CT scan. Look the facial canal here. It's widened. It. No, there is a facial nerve tumor and not a congenital cholesteatoma. I think the CT is important. I will show another one. This one, we have a cholesteatoma here and a granulation, you know, a cholesterol granuloma here in the anterior mesotympanum. So we did do the CT to study the case, and the cholesterol granuloma was a displaced ectopic carotid artery. I think it's important to know this thing before the surgery. That's my point. We can discuss that, but I think it was very important. We published this case with Mauricio. This one case, two lessons. What are the lessons here? The first lesson, you have an obstruction of the mesotympanum and a retraction of the posterior mesotympanum, you know, the pathogenesis of the cholesteatoma. And the second lesson, before the cholesteatoma surgery, if you can, do a CT scan. We will help you. But 
<clears throat> that's this is maybe the most important slide I ever done in my whole life, and I have done thousands. Mm -hmm. And it says that good workup guides to three distinct temporal moments equally important in the pre-op. Today, the diagnosis, this patient has a cholesteatoma, but it brings you back to yesterday to see what's the etiology. No, he has a cleft palate, there's a station tube that doesn't work, or a spatulus, and it projects the future for tomorrow. What's the prognosis of this patient? So this kind of approach it's very important because it will permit the clinician to diagnose, to design a rational therapeutic plan which will make possible today treat established pathology. But if it's a patient that will not have function of the station tube, I will do it open because otherwise uh, I will have a recurrency. So I have to avoid recurrence and protect this patient in the future to abort complications. That's the way I see medicine, not only in cholecytoma, but in general medicine. So what you have to do is to try to cope the stage of the disease and the patient lifestyles with the risk factor for recurrence and the available logistics. I don't have the lasers, I don't have all these fancy procedures, but I try to offer the best to my patients. And it's not few. We have to study, you know, the hearing loss and remember the, the columnar effect of the cholesteatoma. Sometimes you have a cholesteatoma like this that will bring, uh, will bring the sound uh, from the sternal auditory canal to the foot plate here. So you're going to have a cholecetoma with a good hearing. In the end of the surgery, you have a beautiful surgery and the patient is, the, the, the hearing in the first moment dropped. Of course, you have to approach the uh, lateral uh, semicircular canal to see if there is any problem there too in the pre-op. And the facial function, this is obvious. Let's move. So. Benoit, it's, it's useless to have the CT scan if you don't have a plan or a checklist to check the CT scan. Otherwise, you're going to waste money and put radiation in the patient's head. So what's our checklist with the residents? They are here and they can be my witness. So pneumatization is the first. The course of the facial nerve, study of the tagment to see as today they saw, you know, they are very low tagment. Congenital anatomical variations. The relation to the great vessels, like this morning, it's like we have the, this, this lecture has been uh, bought this morning, so to illustrate the case that you have seen this in the morning. So we have the relation with the jugular bulb and also with the carotid artery. The aeration of the protympanum is important, the topography of the lateral sinus, the lateral wall of the otic, that is the first to be eroded in the parsiflastic cholecytomas, and the integrity of the otic capsule, at least for these the CT scan is important, but you have to check. What do you have to discuss with the patients? Well, we have, we have problems with the surgery also. The recurrence, reintervation, you have to discuss with the patient. Uh, of course, additional hearing loss and the facial palsy. And the patient, when you discuss this kind of thing, is ready to go away. You say, well, hold. This is the risk of the surgery. The natural study, uh, the st history of the disease has much bigger risks. So what you have to do is you have to get together and go through the storm and get back in tranquil waters after the surgery. You have to say these things to the patient. They have to know and <coughs> they also have to sign. So to make a, to make a long story short, in the pre-op, we need to decide your technique depending on the extension of the disease the normalization of the temporal bone, the contralateral ear and the risk factors for recurrence, and also the hearing status of the patients. There's some, something that you, are non-negotiable. We need the informed concept on the room. We have the imaging study and the audiological evaluation. So we are ready to do the surgery. And now we have to decide. Now we go wall up or we go wall down. This is a big question. Uh, when you decide for a closed cavity, during the surgery, we can change your mind and go to, open, traditional, uh, to a traditional open cavity that you do. You waste a lot of time doing the closed cavity, and then you say, oh, it's not going to work, so let's move down the wall. This is a waste of time, in my opinion. But if you decide for the open cavity right in the pre-op period, then you, we go open subcortical, as I'm going to show you. And but the other hand, the closed cavity is out of question. So you go straight to open cavity. So we have to decide. 
In the op my opinion, it will be easier to do that in the pre-op. Sometimes you do the trans. To do this kind of surgery, we have to exercise what I call the four axes. Good exposure, good exploration, and good execution of all the middle year contents. So we do it retroauricular. Everybody knows about that. And, and then we have the, a nice periosteal flap here that you can move it to down, up, posterior or anterior, depending on what we were planning to do. There is multi-utilities of this periosteal flap, and you can move it from one side to the other, depending on what you are trying to do and what your intentions in the end of the surgery. Fundamental, canalplasty. You, as a yugo fish, you know, have to remove all the bone, the sternal auditory canal, and in one position of the microscope, you have to see 360 degrees of the perforations of the tympanic membrane. So that's very important. Exposure, it's everything. I know, I'm so spoiled. It is you. Hang on a sec. Excuse me. Hi, hi. Hi. Where's my chips? They're on your plate. No, they're not. Whoa. There they are. Yeah. The bigger, fuller, bouncier, double-breasted burger from Nando's. Well, they say that difficult surgery doesn't, does not exist. The problem is bad exposure, like in this case. So here is fine, Robert. Robert, my director, is here is fine? Oh, great. <laughs> Uh, they mentioned today the endoscopic and the microscope. I think both tools are terrific, and you can, do, you can use both, depending on the situation. Uh, we are presenting a course now in the Brazilian Congress with my two associates here that probably have the course ready, if I understood, that <clears throat> it's the, what you call the endoscopic assisted closed cavity tympanomastoidectomy, the combined approach revisited or redefined. And what's the idea here? The idea is that you can look to the posterior recess, what's the problem in middle ear surgery, through the endoscope. Traditionally, you can do it through the re facial recess, the posterior tympanotomy, but you can reach it with the 30 degree endoscope, as uh, has been shown this morning. So we change the approach, the combined approach, from the approach to the two. So we do it combined, but not with the approach, not opening the tympanic recess, or, but going with the endoscope and checking the posterior recess. It's possible, and it's very simple to do. So we have changed a little bit the concept. So here we have, the, I have done in the, of course, the Photoshop, a posterior tympanotomy here, and you can reach this area through the posterior tympanotomy is still open here to do a cochlear implant. But if you use the endoscope, you can get in here and with the 30 degrees, you reach both the facial recess and the sinus tympani. It will be easier. So I think you should use the endoscope to do this kind of surgery as an alternative to the surgery. Well, so well up or well down? A lot of people who talk about wow up, I will not talk about wow up. I'm going to talk about wow down only and our techniques of wow down that we call inside out tympanomastoidectomy that we will try to show you. So there are indications. We just discussed these indications. And there are two ways to do an open cavity. The conventional, that you do a closed cavity, waste a lot of time, and then mm, it's not, not gonna, it will not work. Let's move to an open cavity. Or you do it subcortical or inside out. I'm going to show you how to do this. Probably many of you will uh, already know. So the conventional, you do it well up, and then you go well down. So you have all the risks of doing a closed cavity in a sclerotic mastoid, and then remove the bone. It's nonsense, in my opinion. Or you start with the subcortical tympanomastoidectomy, that you do a tichotomy, you move back to the antrum, and then to the mastoid. And you have a lot of time, and the surgery is much better. So in our opinion, you have to decide it as soon as possible, this question of doing up or down, because it's very important to do it right away. 
If you have to do things, just do. I hear. I've been looking for you for eight months. Whenever I should have had a gun in my right hand, I thought of you. Now I find you in exactly the position that suits me. I had lots of time to learn how to shoot with my left. And here comes the punchline. When you have to shoot, shoot, don't talk. <laughs> I agree with that, right? <clears throat> so, and why we like so much the surgery? Because I love, I love landmarks, you know, and I'm talking about a really sclerotic or diploicate mastoid, a really not nice mastoid. Uh, I would ask you guys, if you're coming to Bezier by plane, which plane you would like to be? You're landing. Where is Sara? Sara, what's the plane you want to be? In this plane here or this plane with this visibility here? The first one. Yeah, me too. This is a sclerotic master. You are doing surgery on a sclerotic master below and of course in a pneumatizer and the front. This is very scary. I don't like this. I have enough white hair, so I don't need any more. Well, it's, at this point, it's useless, but anyway. So, when you do subcortical, what do you do? You start with removing bone from the attic, you identify the dura, and then you are in a good position, and then you move on backwards. I will show you step by step to finish. And so the subcortical technique is safer because it interpose the chain, the ossicular chain, between the facial and your drill. It's much faster. It's, it follows, it's very important, the cholecytoma pathways being, of course, more physiological, and you end up with a smaller ca uh, cavity. Sometimes you don't need to obliterate anything. And of course, the meatus will be customized, depending on the size of the cavity. So the step one, you have the canagoplasty done. You overdo it a little bit in the posterior superior quadrants, so your drill will fit to open up the attic and expose the head of the malleus and the body of the ingus, if they are there. Sometimes they are not. And then, very important, you will find the middle fossa dura, you know, the thin plate of the middle fossa dura. Once you find the dura, you can move backwards, you know, straight, and then you get into the entry room naturally and identify the, posterior, or the lateral semicircular canal. So, as long as you have the lateral canal, you know the position of the facial nerve right in front of the lateral canal. And of course, also the position of the foot plate. So you are with all your landmarks in your hand, right in the beginning of the surgery. Do you agree with me, sir? So again, the dura, and then you move forward, you identify the canal, you project the facial nerve and the stapes and you create a highway that will go all the way to the sinodural angle, to the cytality angle, without no major important structures. It's easy. Uh, so we we'll go first attic, agitus, antrum, with still, you know, the wall is pretty high, and you go around the corner to mid-mastoid and the mastoid tip if you need. If you don't need to go all the way to the mastoid, you don't go. You, most of the times, you will stop right here. So the cavity will not be so big. <clears throat> In doing so, you have the roots of the section that I just discussed. And it's important. You're going to interpose the ossicular chain, the malleus, and the incus between the drill and the facial nerve and the stapes. It's very good. So it's very safe. Here we have a shield of the lateral canal between the stapes uh, and the oh, facial nerve, the genome of the facial nerve, and your drill. Once you have done it, you go to the middle ear and you do what you call around the corner. I mean, around the clock. You have 12 points of interest 
in the middle year that you have to check them all. Every hour we have something going on. We can, I have this paper here, I can give it to you later, I will not have time to discuss about that, but it's systematically done. And the residents are here and they can serve as witness for me. So we have every hour we have a landmark that you should check. And that's very interesting. It's very, the residents love it. Well, you have to take care and remove also the overhang of bone here in this position because otherwise you can have accumulation of epithelium and keratin here that's very bad. So you have to round off the whole cavity. And then, as long as you remove, you see the facial nerve, as Thibault showed, with the facial nerve, in your vision, you remove the bone over the canal, going all the way close to the facial nerve. And then you're going to reconstruct with the tympanoplastic techniques. Depend on the kind of cavity, you're going to have differential uh, kinds of uh, uh, grafts. And you can reconstruct the tip of the mastoid with an inferior-based uh, periosteal, uh, uh, not graft, it's a flap. Ocycloplasty, when and how? If you do open first stage, if you do closed tympanomastoidectomy, well, if you have cholesteatoma, probably second stage, if it's through granulation tissue and cholesterol granuloma, maybe in the first stage. We have our own prostheses, they are not so fancy like these guys here, and we also like to use a lot of bone and cartilage to reconstruct the canal. The, the three most frequent situations at the end of procedure would be like this, this, and this. We're gonna discuss like this, you have only the stapes, but the mesotympanum is kind of shallow, so you can re accommodate your graft between uh, the head of the stapes and the facial nerve, and you're gonna have a type three tympanoplasty. If it's a little bit uh, not so shallow, then you're gonna need something between the head of the stapes and the graft, and we like to use either cartilage or cortical bone to do that. Put so your gel fund and then your graft. If you don't have the stapes, then you're gonna put some tissue over the foot plate. You have to clearly identify the foot plate, clean it up, put some tissue there, and use a prosthesis, a torp that can be uh, custom made or industrialized, and put your graft. Last but not the least, meatoplasty. So we need, I'm gonna show the meatoplasty pretty fast. So the open cavity done this way uh, there is a question this morning, if you can guarantee that we will not have otorrhea, of course you cannot. But you cannot guarantee that you will not have otorrhea with a closed cavity. You are not a wizard, a magician. Uh, things that sometimes you do your best, sometimes they don't work. But anyway, there is lower recurrence rates and residual disease. The hearing results in my hands are similar to the closed cavity. We have small cavities doing this way. There is a possibility of obliteration with uh, the with the flaps, and the postoperative otorrhea is more, it's rarer if we have a well-designed cavity, rounded off, no hidden recess, adequate control of the eustachian tube, customized metoplasty, and good postoperative control. So, I will show you two, two cases, I guess, well, one case, here we are doing the no, no, this is not the, I will start. With the. I'm going like a sea. They've been falling on me. I've been covered in cold. I've been shrouded in doubt. The movie is very useful at this point. Go for the fascia. Move the fascia. The periosteal flap. You do it posterior uh, based in this case. You move it back. Then you have the mass fight. Oops. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm making a lot of confusion here. I'm trying to be fast and I'm going slower. I'm 
we cut the skin of the steroid continue, uh, the auditory canal through behind. We don't do any incision through the transcanal approach. I think it's a loss of time. 360 degree. This is a good external auditory canal. Then you make the incisions and get into the middle ear, and that's it. You don't instrumentalize the middle ear too much. You go to the to the mastoidectomy. You go to the mastoidectomy and you do it as I said. First, large canalplasty especially post superior here, so you can have space for your drill to go all the way to the, ad, to the atticum and open up the atticum. You see, you check the dura and you move here with the atticotomy and then start following the dura posteriorly and get into the antrum. With the dura here and the canal here, no problem at all. And then you go to the wall. Not so much, you have to make the ident ident identification of the facial nerve here nicely and then you go all the way down. Then you have the facial nerve here, you be very gentle. It's, if it's decent or not, it's not a really big deal if you do it gently. You're removing the skin over the facial nerve and then you drop into the oval window niche if you don't have the staples. The tensor tympany muscle, uh, uh, tendon, very important, right here. Take your time here. This is the good moment, you know, the good adrenaline of the surgery is right in here. Cut the tendon. And another incision is necessary right here. So the graft, I mean the, the tympanic membrane, will drop over the graft. Otherwise, you're going to have a recess here that is really bad in the post-operative. Sometimes you have infection here. And, well, it's all done. Let's do a cycloplasty with the bone. We have tons of bone here. We're going to put some tissue over the oval window and use your prosthesis. Not fancy and costless and nice. You know, I like to do this kind of thing. Put some gel fun. You see, round it off, low wall, all structures identified, and the tympanoplasty. And then, as long as I do this, I go to have a cup of coffee, and my associate Mauricio that is here, he does. You need a plastic. I am already having a coffee, and he's dealing with the bleeding. It's really nice. Removing the cartilage with an anterior or well, posterior based flap here. And then what he calls a U suture that goes from here. And we will tie it up with the periosteal flap back here. Look at here, how it goes nicely. Whoa. It's just perfect. And then another extra surgeon. And that's basically, that's it. So you have, that's the joy of being a otological surgeon. As long as the patient does like this, I can have a drink, you know, there's no bleeding, no nothing. I go home and have a drink, you know? If the facial nerve is working, that's all, that's all right. Let's have a drink. Uh, I'm not crazy, I said 4X in the beginning, and I mentioned the exposure, the exploration, and the execution. The fourth F, X, is something that only your white hairs will bring to you, that is the experience. And as Michael Hawk used to say, good judgment comes from experience, which comes from bad judgment. Like in here. In my last clip, I'm done. It's a situation, man. Eh? Yeah. 
Now's the guy. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> For uh, Sandy, while well, we are preparing the second, uh, second one. Any question for uh, Sandy? First, of course, the approach would be the same to me, like uh, the tube, tube. Exactly. Exactly. We call it subcortical. Yeah, we call it subcortical. Well, I have learned from a professor in Brazil many years ago that he called it subcortical, but it's, we can say, in out approach. Any question? That was great, Saji. Was that you singing, by the way, on the video? <laughs> huh? Was it? Uh, so, um, uh, two questions. One is good judgment comes from bad judgment, which is Will Rogers' quote, not Michael Hawk. Yeah. No? <laughs> no. No. Well, so somebody told me about that. <laughs> but uh, so the question I have is, uh, what do you call? So you have, uh, you know, canal wall up and canal wall down. What do you call um, uh, when you remove the canal wall and then put it back at the end? The hybrid techniques. Do you put them in your classification somewhere? Actually, this is the this is one way to reconstruct the the bony canal. I I have to tell you that I find this technique very complicated to do and to teach. And most of the masters that you can do it, you can do a wall up procedure because you're going to have a nice mastoid. You can open up and skeletonize the posterior wall, remove. What a quick way to show your audience just how tough your film's protagonist is. You got two choices. Option A, you give me the ring. Option B, it's not my stuff. Having him take on the starting lineup of a group of well, anyway, men uh, then you remove the, the wall. You open the recess all the way, remove the wall, and then put it back. I think it's complicated, uh, but I think it's in good hands. Uh, I think it's tremendous, but uh, to teach uh, at the university, I think it's, uh, it doesn't work or somewhat. I mean, I often take the canal wall down, just reconstruct the canal with cartilage or something at the end, which is another That's a good idea. Technique that yeah, we have been working on that, but laying down, you know, preserving the flaps, the periosteal flaps, and laying down the flaps uh, after the surgery, they will fill space. Yeah. And you end up with a small cavity, almost like a normal canal. Yeah. Please? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I saw you were sculpting your own ossicle yes. from cortical bone. What's the long-term stability of this? Does it resorb? Does it? Well, it's uh, as good as any other chart, you know. And we have pretty good hearing the results. We don't have our results with this kind of uh, uh, ossif uh, ossicoloplasty already uh, documented. But uh, we, we get to an average of 25 dB gap, and that's not bad. Sometimes you just uh, draw a small disc of bone and put in the top of the tapes. In my opinion, the secret is that this kind of prosthesis, it has to be, you know, uh, not hanging on bone, otherwise you're going to get ossification. It has to be right in the center and well balanced. It's not so easy. Of course, you have a prosthesis like that and put a collar around the, the steps would be better, but you know, our patients cannot afford that, so we have our own tools. Taji, one question about the ossicle reconstruction with uh, increased transposition. Uh, I had some experience myself when I revise a uh, patient uh, with uh, partial uh, incus transposition, that the incus becomes fixed to the stapes, and it's becoming really very difficult to remove it. So how do you deal with this? Well, to uh, actually we use, uh, we don't use so much the, inc the incus to reconstruct. Uh, we have moved into your technique now that when you, still when you have the stapes, you use like, uh, with, when you have a titanium pulp from the, round, uh, the oval window niche, to the tympanic membrane, the new tympanic membrane. But when you have this kind of ossification, it's really a bad thing because to remove the incus off the stapes is not an easy task. Sometimes reconstruction here is not a good alternative. You have to find another way. Sometimes okay. it's dangerous. Okay, there's... John? John? Just, just to follow up, the room is... Just to follow on from Robert's question, uh, I did the the, mallet, the the torp reconstruction that you do for a few years, 
And I just got disappointed because uh, there was the, the bony ankylosis occurred around the uh, around the oval window. This is, this, this is a good I really, point. I, I just have you got a method yes. of getting around it? Yeah, yeah. You, to address this point is a good point. You you need some details. The first one mm -hmm. you have to around the window. So the prosthesis will touch the tissue and not the bony overhang of the oval window. Second, the tip of this uh, bone has to be very thin, so it will not occupy a lot of space within the window. And you have to also to count on your lucky. That's it. And not touching you know, the, the, the semicircular canals or any other bony structure within the middle ear. If you have a titanium, that would be easier.